To Imperial Rome, the Mediterranean was simply Mare Nostrum, our sea, because Rome ruled it completely on every side. Particularly important was the great triangle formed by Alexandria, Carthage, and Sicily, for these literally provided the bread of life. They were the granary, the breadbasket of the empire. Roman grain ships ferried this precious cargo to Italian harbors servicing the people of Rome. The long North African coast, however, offered few natural harbors to the mariner, so along the Libyan coast, the Romans took advantage of a unique anchorage, the mouth of a wadi, or water course, large enough to afford their small boats some protection. Originally founded by the Phoenicians, perhaps even before Carthage itself was founded in the 9th century B.C., this trading colony fell to Rome in 106 B.C. and grew into a magnificent provincial city. Along her waterfront, stores and warehouses held much of the merchandise which nourished and financed the splendor of Rome itself and brought this African city a high reputation throughout the ancient world. This great commercial center, destined to become the birthplace of an emperor, was called Leptis Magna. After many miles at sea, and prayers to Isis, Roman patroness of sailors with her precious steering rudder in hand, the mariner was rewarded by the sight of land, the coast of present-day Libya, the once blazing lighthouse beacon guided him to Leptis Magna's welcoming harbor. Here on the edge of the desert sand, he found a luxurious and cosmopolitan city, overflowing with every attraction that could be provided by the wealth of Roman trade, colonnaded streets, decorative fountains, and archways on every side. Near the heart of the town was its open market, Two grand pavilions surrounded by booths and stands for selling the foodstuff for which Leptis was famous. Grain tables with their cavities for the standard measuring of wheat, the bushels and pecks of Roman commerce, linear conversion tables, accurate scales and balances for all manner of merchandise so the purchaser could be certain he was receiving fair value for his already empty coffee and denarii. Beautiful glass bottles for unguent, oils, and perfume. Olive oil, a leptis specialty, in earthen jars called amphorae. Olive oil lighted the Roman Empire. In one year, leptis exported 250,000 gallons and all transported in the bulky trading vessels which plied their way through the Mediterranean. In the rope-worn sides of an ancient well, we see a hint of town life itself, a provincial semi-rural life despite its urban sophistication. The townsmen were for the most part not Latin, but Punic, related to the Carthaginians by birth, language, and upbringing. Since behind them lay the fearsome African desert, much of their existence was focused on the sea with its coastal game birds and plentiful fish to enrich their tables. The semi-arid uplands provided pasturage and rich soil for olive groves and also a fertile hunting ground where the men of Leptis captured fierce wild beasts, lions, leopards for sale to the Roman circus. Another cruel spectacle in Leptis, as at Rome, was gladiatorial combat practiced in the amphitheater. But the town had a taste for many softer pleasures, too. Its patron deities were Hercules and Bacchus, called Liber Pater, whose vine-leaf headdress reminds us that he was the god of wine, of the good life, and of theater. This splendid structure was one of the first permanent theaters in the Roman world, where actors were first called dramatis personae, which means the masked people of the play. 
built about 1 AD, the theater was donated by a wealthy citizen named Annibal Tapapius Rufus, whose name is commemorated here in both Latin and Punic, the language native to the region. Interesting to note that much of the city's proud architecture was privately financed, just as today many successful businessmen endow fine libraries and universities. Under the Emperor Hadrian, about 126 AD, were inaugurated the great public baths, among the largest and most handsome in the empire. In such a relaxing atmosphere, the townsmen chatted about business and personal matters. Among numerous pieces of fine sculpture, this one represents Antinous, a young favorite of the Emperor Hadrian. Here, athletes enjoyed a cooling bath to relieve the heat of the African sun. After a dip in the frigidarium, or cold bath, the Roman proceeded to the tepidarium and paladarium, warmer rooms, heated by ingenious hot air systems using hollow tiles as ducts. The sophistication of Roman plumbing has often amazed modern travelers, who may forget that Roman hygiene was never surpassed in the West until our own century. Next to the Hadrianic Bad, the Palestra, or playing field, where Leptitani, the citizens of Lectus, gave themselves over to wrestling and to other outdoor exercises. Finished with his games, the athlete cleaned his skin with olive oil and then scraped himself down with a sickle-shaped tool called a strigil. Over to the northwest of the city, we find another remarkable bath of quite a different type, a domed and vaulted concrete building which is the only one of its kind to survive the centuries intact. Decorated with numerous mosaics and frescoes, here, a boating scene on the Nile, these baths may have belonged to a professional guild of hunters, and hence are called the hunting baths. In the beginning of the third century, Leptis Magna entered its most impressive period of civic construction. A colonnade of streets led to a new museum, a multi-level structure adorned with cascading fountains. All this to the glory of a native son who had risen to the emperorship of Rome. Septimius Severus spoke Latin with an African accent, and his sister embarrassed him by being unable to speak the Roman tongue. During his reign and that of his son Caracalla, he was honored by many important buildings in the town of his birth. Among the first was a new forum, its internal colonnade adorned with gorgon's heads of costly marble imported from the eastern Mediterranean. Originally, both walls and floor were covered with marble too. Adjacent to the forum, a vast basilica over 100 yards long, its coffered ceiling once supported on double tiers of Corinthian columns. These buildings were used as a tribunal of justice and a center of civic and commercial affairs. Their appearance today is somewhat different than it was at the time of Septimius, for some 300 years later, the basilica was transformed into a Byzantine church. The Christians made numerous alterations, including the transplanting of architectural details from other buildings. But the older Roman intention is still plainly visible. The beautiful pink Egyptian granite, exquisitely carved. The local religious cults of Liber Pater and Hercules elaborately illustrated on pillars and doorways. animal life, framed with an extravagant rosette of grape vines and acanthus leaves. Overhead, 
The central nave is patriotically inscribed to Caesar Septimius Severus, appropriately for this soldier emperor. The title Imperator, Emperor, originally meant victorious general. Despite the improvements of Septimius and his son, Leptus Magna soon declined in importance and never again attained its former glory. It survived only to be sacked by vandals in 455 A.D. Leptus Magna was rediscovered by the work of archaeologists. Much of what we see, such as the great four-way arch of Septimius and Eris, has been rescued from the all-encroaching sand only by careful excavation and restoration, the scientific exploration of the past the painstaking reassembly of many pieces lost, buried, or destroyed. A great deal yet remains to be done to increase our knowledge of this great outpost of Roman trade. But as Gibbon said, the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth, the most civilized portion of mankind which will be ever remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. Gibbon's words take on special significance here at Leptus Magna.